Hello and welcome to another episode of Leaders of Transformation. We are launching a series now on conscious capitalism. And so I wanted to bring on some CEOs of companies that are doing business and doing good through their business. And, and in this case, this gentleman, Bobby Herrera, has a wonderful story that he is going on. It's going actually beyond his company and he's sharing with young people and it's just amazing. So he's got a great story and I'm excited to have him here on the Leaders of Transformation. Bobby, welcome. It's great to connect. You're doing great work. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to Lucas Mack for the introduction. Lucas is awesome. Oh my goodness. He has his own podcasts and, and initiatives that he's doing, helping men to heal from their inner wounds. And he's just an amazing uh, human being. He's been on this show as well. So thank you, Lucas, for the introduction. I always like to thank the people that are supporting our podcast. And that is of course our guests and it is the people that are sending us great guests and referring us. It's also you, the listeners and the viewers, because you're the reason why we do this podcast. We do this podcast because we want to inspire you to be the difference maker that you're capable of being. Maybe hearing a story might encourage you along your journey, but maybe it'll also you know, light, like that light bulb in you that says, oh wow, if he's doing, I never thought of that. Maybe I could do something along those lines in my local community. And so we'd love to hear your story. So afterwards, you can go on leadersoftransformation.com. You can find us uh, through our contact page. Or of course, you can find us on social media and let us know what you're doing. Which, let us know what you're also planning to do. And if there's a way that we can support you along that journey. All right. Well, let me give you a little bit of uh, background on Bobby Herrera. He is the co-founder and CEO of Populous Group, which is one of the fastest growing HR services companies in the United States. They have annual revenues of 500 million. As one of 13 children in a migrant family, he learned the value of hard work, rising early, and putting in long hours in the field. He is the author of the book, which I've had the opportunity to read, which is called The Gift of the Struggle. And so we're going to talk about that. What is the gift of the struggle? And, you know, success takes work. And so we're going to possibly maybe dispel some myths, you know, because there's a lot of gurus out there that are saying you just have to be, and you kind of sit there and visualize it and all happens. But the reality is if you want to make great things happen in the world. You got to get to work. And so we're going to, we're going to talk about that. And there's a great gift in the journey. And uh, so with that, Bobby, actually let's, let's talk about why is the struggle such an important part of the journey to success? But, you know, Nicole, the irony of uh, being a guest on your podcast, you know, which is all around transformation and becoming that person that you imagine inside, you know, the one thing that always comes before transformation is struggle. Yes. And I, often, I often say that the long way is the shortcut because, I mean, you must first go through struggle, pain, and suffering to get to wisdom. And that's the summit that we want to achieve, whatever mountain we're climbing, and there's no way to get there without going through struggle first. Absolutely. And I think that we, as, I don't know, there's like this, this myth out there that things are, and I've heard this, literally had people say, it's supposed to be easy. It's supposed to flow. Like, <laughs> where's the flow? You know, there can be flow in the struggle, right? It's, I, I think it's the way that we approach, at least for my own my own experience, you know, you can be flowing and still have things be a struggle, but you're, you're moving with it. Or if you're resisting it, then it can be very uncomfortable and slow and out of flow. Can you talk a little bit about that process? Well, I mean, I, I can speak from obviously my lens. Um, you know, Nicole, I think that we're intuitively a very uh, uh, insecure species deep inside and often we'll look around and we're like, okay, am I the only one that's feeling this way? Like, am I the only one that's getting the tar kicked out of me? Am I the only one that feels like they're not enough? And, you know, often we tend to tell ourselves that narrative, but you know, everyone's going through something. Everybody struggles. And you know, I think throughout my journey, as I reflected and looked back on every one of those you know, transformational chapters that I had been a part of, every single one of them, I somehow, some way went through struggle as a prequel to whatever I was pursuing. And, you know, I 
every one of us feels that way. Yes. Yes. Well, and that's where we learn, you know, that's, I mean, mm-hmm. that's where we learn. We learn in the valleys, not on the mountaintops. That's right. You know? right. My, my yeah. dad had a, my dad had a, um, you know, a little thing that he did. You know, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm one of 13 kids. So, you know, I still eat with my elbows on the table, Nicole. So my wife hasn't been able to break me in like over 20 years. And yeah, there were always kids running around, grandkids, kids. And anytime that one of the kids fell or was stumbling with something, you know, a kid would fall and he'd like do the baseball sign safe. And so, you know, he was always sending us that signal that, Hey, it's okay to fall. You're going to fall. That's how we learn. And although I think we all intuitively know that when we're in the turbulence of whatever struggle we're going through, it's hard to see. Yes. Like, you know, I often say you'd have to be crazy to want to struggle, but you'd have to be crazier to think that you're not going to. It's like, Yes. Part of the human condition. Yes. So before we talk more about the struggle, well, I mean, this story is all about struggle, but Mm -hmm. um, we'll dive into that a little bit further. But, you know, you mentioned about your dad and in reading your, in your reading your book, your dad was a great hero and mentor for you. You learned so much from him. And so tell us a little bit about that backstory to why this is so, in, the, why you're so passionate about this. And I know you have the bus story. Like, tell us the, what, what really launched this for you. Yeah. Um, well, you know, um, I start the book with you know, my marker story, you know, the bus story, and maybe we can get to that in a moment. But, you know, I believe we all follow a thread. And, you know, there's previous chapters from our family's journey that we inherit somehow. And my dad, he was a bracero from Mexico, which for those of us that aren't history buffs, you know, the bracero program was a, an exchange program between Mexico and the U S it started early in the world war era where Mexican men would come to the United States while the U S men were off fighting in the war and do temporary contract work, working in, most of it, mostly agricultural fields, doing the backbreaking work. And, you know, my dad, he, the year he was selected in 1954, he was one of 300,000 men selected. Wow. Out of a million that stood in line. And, you know, he had waited in line for nine years, Nicole, to be selected as a bracero. So, I mean, just that in itself was an amazing signal of, you know, resilience and, and, and just, a desire for him to create a better future for, you know, for his children and for the family. And, uh, you know, he did that for 10 years. He would be gone from the family nine, 10 months out of a, at a, at a time. You know, I can barely stand to be away from my coconuts for two, three days. And just what he went through to help break the cycle of poverty for my family. And, um, and then, you know, eventually migrating the family over and, you know, the mid sixties after that program ended, um, there's just so many lessons in there about, you know, doing more for others and giving more than he was taking from us to create a better story for me. And yeah, he was, he was nine foot tall in my eyes. And I think we all have those figures in our life that we just want to honor the sacrifice and everything they did for us. And he was one of those for me. We are a product of our environment often yeah. and, mm-hmm. and we can, and I say often we are, and sometimes we can, it depends on how we interpret it, that we can go one direction or another direction or many other directions. Yeah. And for you, that inspired you. And, you know, even like this gift of the struggle, you know, you talk about in your book about seeing your dad struggle, the seeing that resilience and how that shaped and molded you later on through some of the challenges and remembering back and saying, my dad could do this. And surely yeah. I can, I can handle what I'm going through right now. So it's, no doubt. it's, uh, it's great to have those stories and it's great. We can look back to those stories, but then every day we're creating those stories for the next generation. So, yeah. yeah. They're, they're laced in every one of our chapters. We just often, uh, fail to slow down to study those events. The, you know, often we want to forget them. It's like, Oh, I'm so glad it's over. Like I never want to go through that again. Whereas 
I would recommend the opposite. Like, hey, go back to those marker events. Write down what that struggle was. And then right next to it, write down what it taught you. Like what gift did it deliver for subsequent chapters in your story? And, you know, it's a simple exercise, but it's a very eye-opening exercise. If, you know, if we all went back to the beginning and did that for some of those marker struggles that we had, I'll bet that you will pull out some prize gifts that have served you very well in your, you know, in your life. It's kind of the difference between going through life and getting through life, if you will, Mm -hmm. and enjoying life and experiencing the fullness of life. Mm -hmm. There's the difference of, you know, it's like, I just need to hear that all the time. I just need to get through today. I just need to get through today. (laughs) You know, I need to get through this week. Yay. It's TGIF, you know, and, and you miss, you miss the process. You miss the journey. You miss the richness Mm -hmm. of it. And, uh, that's, That's the right. gift within the struggle. So tell us your bus story, that marker story. Yeah. Uh, so when I was 17, my brother, Ed and I, we were on a return trip home from a basketball game. And along the way, we stopped for dinner. And everyone unloaded off the bus, except for me and Ed. You know, at that point, like we didn't have the means to play sports and afford dinner. And it's just the way life was for us. We knew our parents were doing the best they could. And so a few moments after the team unloaded, one of the dads to the other players, he steps on board the bus. And as he's walking back, Nicole, he teased me a little bit because Ed had outscored me that night. And then he said something to me that I will always remember. Bobby, it would make me very happy if you would allow me to buy you boys dinner so that you can join the rest of the team. Nobody else has to know. All you have to do to thank me is do the same thing for another great kid just like you on this bus. And like to this day, I have a hard time explaining how I felt in that moment. Like I had this wave of gratitude come over me that it still gives me goosebumps. And I remember stepping off the bus that evening, Nicole, and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. I mean, Mm -hmm. I wanted to join the army a year later, which I eventually did. But outside of that, I was clueless. But although I had no idea what I was going to do after that moment, I knew why. I would mm-hmm. somehow, some way, figure out a way to create something that would allow me to pay forward that kind act to other kids like me who were born on the wrong side of the opportunity divide. And it, it, just, it, it, it just transformed the way I viewed my life. Because up to that point, like, I had the ultimate struggle, which you know, I would often ask myself, will my story ever matter? You know, I had more reverse role models in my life than I cared to admit, you know, aside from the economic struggle, life was really challenging for, for our family. And I didn't know if I would ever get out of that, that part of my life. And, you know, not only did he teach me that my life could someday matter, but, you know, he taught me so many valuable leadership lessons in the way that he did it. And, you know, for one, he taught me that one of the single most important parts of leadership is seeing and encouraging potential. Like that was the very first time in my life that I felt seen and it, it changed the course for me. Well, and the way that he did it in, there was respect in there and just um, not, not saying, Hey, I'm going to do it. And, a lot of times what happens is people are like, Hey, I'm going to help you. And I'm going to tell everybody else that I'm helping you too. Cause you need it. And, they, and he didn't do that. And that's just no. so, There's so such, profound. such humility in the way that he did it. And, you know, I should probably figure out who said this cause I, I reference it all the time, but yeah, you know, someone once said humility is a secret of the wise. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he called me to do more. And by the way that he did it, like, he called me to action to do it for someone else, which is the ultimate box that we want to check in life is we want to do things for others and serve others. And, um, you know, people have often asked me, like, Hey, well, what if he wouldn't have said that? And I was like, well, I mean, I'll never know, but maybe my, like, I, I, I think my pride may have taken over and I may have said no. And, you know, I also reflect on that moment and I wonder whether or not I would have figured it out on my own had that not happened. And, 
that's not a real comfortable thought for me, Nicole. I, you know, had that not happened, who, who knows whether or not I would have experienced something else that gave me purpose and identity, something to believe in. But that's what he did. Like he, he showed me that he wanted more for me than from me, which is a tremendous attribute in leadership. Like we need to have want more for our people than we want from our people. And with one kind gesture, like he cemented that in my leadership philosophy for life. Wow. So powerful. And um, what you said there about who knows where your life would be. We all have those moments mm. and coming back to what we were just talking about, a lot of times we pass over them and say, that's done. That's a time in my life. I don't want to go back to, but that's where the richness, I mean, your why is there that your heart. And when you look at your company now in this heart that you have, and even as you share that story, which I know you've shared it many times, it still is that it still touches your heart and it's not coming from your head. It's coming from your heart. Mm. Totally. I can feel that. And that's the same thing that you bring into your company and the why that you, you know, developed your company and why you do the things that you do in your company. And as it's even grown and been successful, it becomes the, the guidepost, the marker for you, you, everything you do. And if you don't stop and check in and, and, capture that you miss it mm -hmm. and that's that's where i think a lot of us we miss that meaning in our life because we didn't pay attention to that so yeah, yeah talk about the populist group so you went on to do you're a veteran and so yes. you went on to be in the military and and then your book talks and tells you know the, the journey mm -hmm. and then you launched this company and as we talk about conscious capitalism um you know, it is about profit. Sure. You've got a profitable business, but mm -hmm. it is about that heart that you're bringing into it and caring about people. So tell us a little bit more about how, um, this company was birthed and how you yeah. do it differently. Well, um, you know, in the book, I also uh, was very open and forthright and it, it's laced with a lot of the mistakes that I made because you know, one, I wanted to write the book that I wish someone would have written for me. Like I would read books out there and I was like, am I the only one that's this imperfect out there? And, you know, 15 years after that moment on the bus in 2002, I, I started my now community populist group. And back then it was a company. And so I started populist group in 2002 with two other great gentlemen. And I often say the first five years were the most fun I never want to have again. You go like, you know, in school terms, we flunked at least three times. We made so many mistakes. We were dodging arrows like any other entrepreneur out there. And, you know, the second five years, we had some good fortunate return on luck for those first five years and things started kind of coming together. A lot of turbulence that, you know, I highlight in the book, but, you know, the reason I'm highlighting those two errors is one of the things that I want to bring, bring to light here is that bus story, it was raging like an inferno inside of me. And it was like, it, it had become the invisible force that drove me to start my entrepreneurial journey. Like I wanted to create something that would allow me to be Mr. Teague, the dad that came on the bus for other people. But I made a big mistake. I was the only person except for my wife and my brother who had been on the bus with me that knew that story. Nobody else knew. And so here I was this intense, passionate, hard charging. Like I wasn't burning the candle at both ends. I was looking for more wax. And there was this intensity about me that my company didn't understand. And they knew I wanted to build something. I was you know, doing my best, but no one knew why. And finally, about 10 years in, I finally figured out that vulnerability is a core competency of leadership. And I mustered up the courage to tell that story. And when I did, it changed everything. And I often say that it started the transformation of my company becoming a community, which if you're going to build an organization centered around conscious capital, building something that does good in the world, you have to go through that. It's not about building a company. It's about building a community. And at the core of that is going to be that marker story that gives you energy, that gives you purpose, it gives you identity. And that started the transformation of our 
company becoming a community and we've been building on it ever since. You know, we turned 17 last September, which is the same age that I was when I was uh, on that bus. And we're, yeah, we're just a big teenager who's learning a lot, doing our best and trying to make our mark on the world by helping kids and veterans out there. Brilliant. There, in there, you talk about um, there's so much, there's so much that we can pull from that and extract in terms of lessons that people can apply. But the one that really stands out for me is because nowadays marketing is such a driver of business mm. and of course messaging. And I hear so often that people are trying to manufacture a story, like make one up. Mm. Like I have to have had this horrible, difficult thing and have had, you know, abuse in my childhood. I need to go find the abuse. I've got to find the alcoholism. I've got to find the addiction. I've got to find the thing, you know, that I can, that I can tell that story that makes it, you know, makes me a good speaker. makes me, you know, a good, whatever influencer. And what I hear in what you were just sharing, it's not about those stories. It has to be something that is like, you don't actually have to manufacture it because that'll never work. And people will see right through that. Even if they don't see it and know why they just know that there's a disconnect. It's flat. It's a yeah. flat story when you share that story versus the stories are there and a simple little story like that, which can change the direct trajectory of your life and drive you for and fuel you for a lifetime is there. It's just taking the time to find it. And to, or to be aware of it, to remember it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it is a deep excavation that you have to do. And yeah. you're right, it doesn't have to be around a traumatic event. You know, it, you know I'll often ask, you know, whether I'm you know, working with a leader at a company that's trying to bring their identity to life or their culture or their purpose and their meaning, you know, I'll often ask them a simple question. It's like, hey, take me to the origin story. Like, take me to the very beginning, the flap of the butterfly wings. Like, why is it so important for you to make this journey ultra successful? Right? Because, yeah, dreams aren't free. You have to fund these dreams. So, like, put the profit aside. Put the fact that you want it to be economically successful. Like, what is it that you want to create that's going to make your heart sing? And why? And they just keep digging on that. Like there's a story in there that gave you energy, that gave you meaning, like that really is going to make you check that box. And, but you have to do that deep excavation. And I was very fortunate. I knew what it was. I was just too afraid to tell the story. Like I hadn't yet, you know, my, you know, my wife says my frontal lobe wasn't fully developed yet. And I agree with her. And I finally mustered up enough courage to tell that story. And, you know, at the core of that story, after I did that, it's like people understood who I was and why it was so important to me. They're like, oh, now I know why he's so intense. Now I know why this is so important to me. And I think as a leader, one of the things that we have to give, uh, said another way, we have one thing we're responsible for and that we have to give our people is we have to give them contribution. And up to that point, I hadn't given them something to contribute to. And so because I hadn't done that, they didn't know how to help me. And there's no other way to do it. If you don't give them that contribution, that story, that real deep why, they won't, they, they won't know how to help you. And trust me, they want to help you. Talk about that. People want to help you. Well, I mean, I think intuitively, every single one of us want to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And that's part of that transformation from, you know, being a company to being a community. Like when you're part of something that's bigger than yourself, something that's really going to leave a mark on the world, something that's really going to be in line with those core beliefs that you have. You know, so you know, we're students of Patrick Lencioni and, you know, his first question in, you know, his critical questions that you must answer is, you know, why do we exist? Well, we exist because we believe everyone deserves an opportunity to succeed. And at the core of that is the bus story, right? Like I'm a sucker for the underdog. Like my battle cry is all hell the underdogs. I end the book that way. And, you know, we live to put the underdog on stage and that's it for us. Like that right there is what makes our hearts sing with joy. 
I love it. So in your, in your company, how do you do things? Obviously people know that they're contributing and they get why they're doing what they're doing. So they're going to be more motivated for sure. I mean, mm-hmm. in disengagement within employees, you know, in the workplace is like at an all time high. Right. And, you know, in your organization, I, I, I'm pretty sure that the engagement's going to be the, the in-game age engagement is going to be that much higher because they get why they're there. Now, beyond that, how does that play out in terms of different practices, things that you do differently to honor your team, the people that are part of your community and, and your clients that are coming in, what do you do differently? How do you operate that might be a non-traditional way of doing business? Well, here's how I'll answer that, Nicole. Um, maybe I don't answer it from the term of differently because like, I don't know what, what mm-hmm. I'd like to believe is there, there's a lot of great organizations out there doing things for the good of others. And, uh, so I'll answer it more from the lens on how we've built a lot of intentionality around, around like that story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, first and foremost, you know, like I believe there's a lot of organizations that unintentionally overlook three things that's going to make a real significant impact on the strength of their culture, i.e. their brand, their identity, right? Because really the brand of an organization is a lagging indicator of the strength of their culture. And so I'm going to pick out three simple things. You know, most organizations, they hire, onboard, and train. Well, intentional organizations that want to build something bigger than themselves with a very intentional culture that's conscious about doing good in the world, they don't hire, onboard, and train. They select, welcome, and develop. And so it's a minor tweak, yet there's a big difference, right? So let's take selection. First and foremost, organizations that select, the first thing they do when they sit across the table from someone who is going to wants to be a part of their community, the first thing they do, and we ceremoniously do that, we flip over the resume. We don't talk about a single thing on the front. We want to know, hey, tell us, take us back to the beginning. Tell us your story. We want to find out what you believe and why you believe it. And that's where we check the first box. Do they believe what we believe? Are they an underdog at heart? Do they want to be a part of something bigger than themselves? Do they want to help us bring the bus story to life? Like that's an example of just that one simple piece. So uh, I highlight that in the spirit of time because everything that we build into our, our human systems, the things that we do to reinforce our culture are around systems that connect back to the bus story, back to our culture, back to our identity, everything yeah. we do. Well, and, and I'm glad you said that because, and that's kind of where I was going with it is because when you have a mission, when you have a deeper why, everything changes in the way that you do it, the way that you communicate it. And I love that where you're actually getting to know people and people want to be known. Right. They don't want to be categorized and they want to be seen and they want to be heard. They want to, they don't want to be categorized and, you know, and you look at resumes nowadays and been like that for a long time but i mean you know the the keywords you know i gotta have the the team player Uh, keywords or whatever the you know the latest greatest buzzwords are all the sexy words right yeah and (laughs) and so they all look the same you know all the resumes ultimately have the same keywords and so so what so how do you know which is you know how do you how do you find those people that are going to be a good fit for your culture and are going to support what you're doing. And um, so you mentioned about select, welcome mm-hmm. and develop. Yeah. I love that where you're welcoming them yeah. in and you're not, you're not like, okay, good luck. I hear that from right. companies sometimes it's like, okay, we're going to give you a shot. And then if you make the cut, you get to stay, you know, kind of like sports teams, right? And then you get to stay. And yeah. if not, you're out, you know, who's and, that going to engage? Right. <laughs> Yeah, you're always looking over your shoulder. Exactly. It's like, let me scare the tar out of them. You know, I think a lot of organizations unintentionally do that, right? So they'll, they'll, they'll identify someone yeah. to be a part of the organization. 
And, you know, I'll often kick into sarcastic mode and say, you know, on the first day they show up, their manager's late. The rest of the team has no idea they're going to be there because they didn't communicate it. Yep. And then the manager finally shows up and then walks them down the hall to HR, who poor HR gets a bad rap. HR scares the tar out of them by showing them a lot of documents that they got to sign. And then they get escorted back to their team who still doesn't know who they are or why they're there. And they start job shadowing. And by this time, the person's all like, uh, did I make the right choice? Well, we've actually flipped the lens. So we welcome. And so when you welcome someone, it's like inviting them into your home. Like you get ready for them, you know they're coming, and you just lay out the welcome mat. And when else are you going to have someone join your community at a higher point of engagement? And for one week, all we do is engulf them in the story that we're narrating. Like we have systems built around their entire welcome. They don't do one single job-related activity in that first week. Wow. They learn our culture code. They call, they do a culture quiz. They call climbers. That's what I call our employees. We have a, a climbing theme. And I don't believe in the word employees. It doesn't mean anything. And so I'm a climber. I've embedded that into our culture. And so they'll call climbers from across the country, answer questions that are deeply embedded. They'll learn stories. And so by the end of the first week, Nicole, they have so much context. Yes. And then, then when they do start those job-related activities, which are a necessity, right? Yep. They know why they're doing them and they know what we're about. And they've also built this network of supporters that you know, have re reduced that anxiety that, that they felt that first week. And so a welcome reduces anxiety versus onboarding in most cases unintentionally increases it. So that's, that's where, and this isn't judgment about other companies. This is no. just about an awareness and saying, right. this is what you, based on how you showed up in the culture that uh -huh. in the, the context in which you created the company, there are just things that you're going to do. You're going to see differently. And you're going to do differently mm -hmm. because of the, where right. you're coming from in doing that. And so that's why I love you sharing that. It's not to say that one's wrong and one's right. And all. it's not about any of cool. that. It's yeah. about, wow, what can we learn from that? And every company can have that narrative. And it's like, you know, the, the saying you have seven seconds to make a first impression. Well, you have that one week ultimately to make a first impression. Right. And that's where people go, oh, I see how the game is played. That's it. And so what game do you want them to see? What culture, what, what experience do you want them to buy into? And so very, very powerful. Let's could, shift gear. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Nicole, no, we'd be naive to think that they're not silently saying to themselves, did I make the right choice? Yes. You know, am I at the right place for my family and for my future? People have options. Like there's a rage and war for talent out there. Yes. It's, it's more vicious than it's ever been. And it's not going to get any better anytime soon. Matter of fact, let's brace ourselves. And you know, people are looking for contribution. They're looking for uh, a place where they can be part of something bigger than themselves. They're challenging us as leaders to lead with more compassion, to lead with more, um, uh, with more purpose. And I think it's a great thing. Well, if we don't do these things that at heart, like the selection welcome, I started doing those things because of things that annoyed me when I didn't have the choice to change the game. I felt like people were basing who I was based on what my resume said. And that didn't define who I was. And I created our welcome around a couple of unfortunate onboarding experiences that I had in my professional journey. So all I basically did was ask myself, well, what are some of the things that annoyed the heck out of me when I was going through that? And yeah. you know, to, to, to quote the, uh, uh, the uh, wise George Costanza of Seinfeld, I just did the opposite, right? So. Well, and that's the thing is, is a lot of times because we learn this is the game, then we say, right. I guess this is just the way the game is played. And then yeah. you continue to play that game that way. And then, and then you, everybody complains about things aren't different. Well, yeah. it's kind of 
inherent in that yeah. decision that we've made to allow it to be this way. And mm -hmm. I think that's where nowadays, when you look at business, there's so many disruptions happening where people are saying, why are we doing that? And the millennials, those darn millennials, which uh -huh. ask questions like why, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, you get people saying like, why are they uh -huh. asking these questions and they, they're lazy? No, they're asking really good questions yes. that actually can, can, can help companies to get back to what their core story is. That's it. And, and so, yeah, there's a great shift, a great transformation that gets to happen mm -hmm. in the marketplace. And you're at the forefront of that and just doing some of these things that you're, you're doing that you're just doing. You're like, well, I just did it because I experienced the opposite. And I didn't like it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, um, setting examples coming back to your bus story, it's setting mm -hmm. the example and paying it forward for someone else. Yeah. So let's talk about the struggle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So my family, we have this, uh, we used to have this, this motto. So, uh, dream struggle, victory, mm -hmm. learned it somewhere along the way from some yeah. speaker said it, dream, struggle, victory. There was a point in my life that I had a, I was at a personal development uh, training program and, and I had been for years in personal development. So this was not new to me, but I was in this, in this fishbowl, if you will, so deep that I didn't see what was actually going on until all of a sudden I was there and I was confronted with this experience and I won't go into all of it, but the, the, the lesson out of it was I literally got on, on the phone afterwards and called my parents and we were in business together and so forth. And I called them up and I said, oh my gosh, I think I know what the problem is. One of the problems. And they said, what? And said, we fell in love with the struggle. Meaning that we stuck and stayed in the struggle versus getting to the victory. You know what I mean? So we actually perpetuated, we kind of stuck, get stuck in that, in that mode. That's not what you're talking about here. It, it's learning from it and moving beyond it. But it was just, it was so interesting. And as I was reading, I was like, gift of the struggle. I'm like, okay. And the, immediately it brought me back to that, that uh -huh. experience where, you know, there are people that it's like, you got to hustle, you got to work hard. And, and actually what they're inadvertently doing is getting stuck in the struggle and making it more difficult for them versus getting the gift of the struggle and moving beyond it and building on that. So can you talk about that distinction? Yeah. Um, Nicole, let me tell you a quick story that I think will give appropriate context. So a year after I had that wonderful experience on the bus with Mr. T, I raised my hand and I joined the army. And it was about three weeks into basic training where you're in the right in the heart of that mental haze and physical breakdown. And I had several times asked myself, what in the world did I get myself into? And it was about 1130 at night and my entire platoon, we were up late. It was before midnight, around midnight, polishing our boots by flashlight. And all around me, I could hear my fellow soldiers complaining about the night that was nowhere, has no one in sight, and the morning that was going to start way too soon. And I remember vividly thinking to myself, like, wow, it's like, I've been getting up in the wee hours of the morning to work in the fields ever since I was yay high. Like, I know what it's like not to have any material comfort. I had unfortunately even been asked to leave the table because of the color of my skin. And I remember vividly thinking for the very first time, there is nothing that they can say or do to me that I haven't somehow faced before. And I specifically said to myself, maybe this was part of the plan. And I started seeing my life differently. And you know, it wasn't as clear for me then, yet now looking back, like that was the flap of the butterfly wings of what ultimately became my leadership philosophy. And that is that we all struggle. Every struggle teaches us something. That's the gift. And leadership is sharing those gifts with others. And I started looking at every part of my life differently and things that I'd experienced. And from that day forward, I started like 
really intuitively reflecting on things that were happening to me, not that they didn't suck in the moment, yet really extracting those lessons. And when I inevitably faced something that was similar or felt similar, and we always are going to experience something new, I'd be like, okay, where have I experienced this before? And it's just the way that my simple brain started working. And over time, I just kept repeating that, and repeating that, and repeating that, and repeating that, putting one foot in front of the other, and just trying to encourage those around me to do the same. And it became a, uh, you know, like, I want to transform how the, the way the world views struggle. Like, I want them to see it as a source of empowerment that it really is. And that's where it started for me. And often it's hard for us to see that in the moment, but it's usually I can, I can walk a leader through a simple exercise and they're like, oh, and some of the letters that I'm getting from, you know, across the world, people that have, you know, fortunately picked up the book and they're writing me these letters that are like, like bringing me to my knees or that, hey, I went through this and now looking back, I see that it taught me this and taught me this. And like, it's like, you know, it's, it's so heartwarming and I'm so happy that they're reframing their struggles. Yeah. What I hear in that is in that distinct, and thank you for that, sharing that story. And I remember that you shared that in your, in your book as well. And I thought about that actually too, because you hear, you hear people, they'll say like, I work 50 hours this week and, <laughs> and you know, I'm like, Oh, so it's a part-time for you. big for you, yeah. you know, <laughs> but b- based on my experience of working right. hard and my parents were immigrants as well. And um, from Europe, and they just knew how to work hard. So mm. seven days all in. So working 70, 80 hours was kind of like a light week. And um, but coming back to what you said there was the distinction is whether or not you use, like you said, it's empowering to share those stories, mm-hmm. whether or not you are using those struggles as building blocks to move, to climb or whether or not you're, you're seeing those struggles, which at that point in what we were going through, my parents and I, is uh, that we were underneath the struggle. So we were, it was like under the circumstances, if you will, mm-hmm. versus using the circumstances to grow and to, to learn and to grow. So yeah, great, great distinction. And you know, I love seeing the face and the pupils dilate of, you know, I do a lot of storytelling for kids and veterans. And when I tell them some of these stories and like, you can see the light bulb go off. And when I tell them that I, I said, well, maybe this was part of the plan and they'll start mentally making a list of, well, I've been through this, I've been through this. And just to see, like, you can feel it when they are saying to themselves, maybe I do have what it takes. And that is a great day for me. Like I have a mantra anytime I speak to any of these kids or veterans, And I call it just one. Like, I just want to get one to see their life differently so that they can take control of that wonderful story that they're narrating. And I do that every time. Nicole, it's a great day for me. And I'm high-fiving all the way home. So it's it's wonderful to see that look in their eye. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to end and to encourage our listeners to go and experience more of that. So get a copy of Bobby's book. So the gift of the struggle and um, gift, the gift of struggle, excuse me. And uh, also we're going to make sure that link is in the show notes. He also has a blog series, which is also on his website. So that's bobby-herrera.com. And again, we'll have this in the show notes, um, but he actually has a blog series on the students of struggle. So there's different stories that you can hear. So you can get this experience and relate and realize that it's not just you. You're not the only one experiencing struggle and the struggle is a gift and there's so many lessons and it's actually, it's a blessing. Those are all blessings. And I've learned that, you know, in myself and the last number of years, especially realizing that, and I've had people say, Oh my gosh, so so bad that this happened, that happened. And, and yet at the same time, I look at it and every single one of those experiences was, was a gift because it made me who I am today. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I hear that in, in Bobby and his story, it made him who he is. And for you that is listening, it's, it's made you who you are. And when you 
discover that gift and you embrace that gift, unwrap it and enjoy it and play with it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to open up a whole new world for you. So we encourage you to do that. I believe that leaders of, tra of transformation take action. So do that. Take a few minutes today, preferably, but if not today, schedule it in your calendar today to do it at a later date, but to sit with that, sit in that story, sit, go back and remember, you know, buy, buy uh, his book and, and go through his process and his journey so that it'll help you along your journey. But do that, go and spend that time and do that. We'd love to hear your stories. You can go on leaders of and share with us there privately through, you can email me there or you can go on social media and you can find us through that. We'd love to hear those stories of how this has impacted you and how the gift of the struggle has shaped and molded you to be the difference maker and the world changer that you're capable of being. I do believe that every single person is a world changer at heart. And even if that is just reaching that one person, you know, that Mr. Teague who met that, you know, it's like one conversation and maybe he had many conversations, but it's this one we're talking about. It's one person. You can impact one person that goes on and changes the world. And, and so that's why I believe that every single person is capable of being a world changer and doesn't have to be in the limelight, having the fame and the fortune and all that kind of stuff. That's oftentimes not where the world has changed, you know, through that. So Bobby, thank you. I appreciate you being here and sharing your heart and your stories. And, uh, yeah, I'm very grateful. inspiring. Oh, yeah. Thank yeah. you for having me. And, you know, in the, in the book, cause it's not always easy at the end of every chapter, I put some simple thought provoking questions to help guide the journey Yes, because uh, sometimes we need some help getting that hamster wheel spinning and uh, they'll, they'll get the hamster wheel spinning to help you now na narrate that story better. And yeah, I'll help the underdog. They do have what it takes. Do some good. Yes. Amen. And on that note, thank you for being here. Thank you to our listeners for being here. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Leaders of Transformation real soon.